Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for February 2024. My name's Hayley and this month's highlights include Comet Kushida, the Sea of Showers on the Moon, the Open Cluster M41 and our Constellation of the Month which is Canis Major. Let's begin by taking a look at the planets. We need to wait for later in the year for the planets to be really well positioned for observing, but there are still opportunities this month and in the coming months for those of us that are determined planet watchers. Saturn, Mars and Mercury are all not well placed for observing at the moment. They're all low to the horizon, horizon or very close to the sun. But Jupiter, Venus and Uranus are all good targets for us this month. So we'll start with Jupiter. Um, and if we have a look here, we're looking towards the south on the 1st of February around 9 o'clock and we can see that Jupiter has already risen. If we go back to around sunset, you can see that as the sun sets, Jupiter's already nice and high in the sky and as we go through the evening, it's actually getting lower and lower. So the best time to observe Jupiter is as soon as you've got a dark sky, as early as possible, um, once the sky is dark, and then it will set just after midnight. And the best time of the month to observe for all three of these planets is going to be at the beginning of the month because they're all getting lower as the month goes on. So if I look at Jupiter at nine o'clock on the 1st, you can see um, its altitude. And if I look again on the 29th, you can see that it's much lower. So earlier in the month is better. You can observe Jupiter with your naked eye. It will appear like a very bright star. You can observe with a pair of binoculars and look out for Jupiter's disk and its four Galilean moons. Or you can go in a bit closer with your small telescope and see if you can make out some of these features on um, the surface or in the cloud belts of the, the planet. Lying close to Jupiter this month is the planet Uranus. So it's quite a good opportunity to find Uranus if you haven't managed to do so already because it's in quite a nice location, it, right in between the Pleiades star cluster in Taurus and Jupiter down here. Um, if you want to spot Uranus with your naked eye, it's tricky to do um, because it's very faint and it's indistinguishable from the faint stars surrounding it. Similarly, with a pair of binoculars, it will look like a star. If you have a small telescope, then the thing to look out for is to see if you can make out that um, it does actually show a disc and to see if you can make out its greenish colour. If you are struggling, struggling to find it, you can have a go on the 15th when it will be very close to the crescent moon. And normally we say don't try to observe faint things when the moon is around because the light from the moon can wash out some of the light from the faint thing that you're trying to observe. And that is true. Um, but sometimes the moon can provide us with a very useful pointer and it's kind of worth the trade off between the light from the moon getting in the way and its usefulness as a pointer and also the um, enjoyment of seeing both the moon and your faint object, in this case Uranus, uh, together in the night sky. So if we put them both in a binocular view, this is the view in a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars, you can see that they'll fit easily together in a binocular view. So that's in, on the evening of the 15th. Um, as soon as you've got a nice dark sky, see if you can go out and spot um, Jupiter, first of all, and then the crescent moon and then the tricky spot, which is the planet Uranus. If we go to Venus now, so... Jupiter's an evening planet, Uranus an evening planet, and Venus is a morning planet. So best time of day to observe Venus is around 7 o'clock in the morning. And similarly to Jupiter, its visibility gets worse as the month goes on. So again, nice and early in the month is the best time to see Venus. So here we are in the southeast on the 1st of February. If I zoom in. you can see that Venus is showing a gibbous phase. So you can have a go at that with your small telescope if you have one. And the trade-off with Venus is brightness of the sky versus how high it is. So if we go back, you can see Venus is lower if we try and go out earlier. So it's more difficult to spot it because it's close to the horizon, but the sky is darker. So the 
thing to do is to try to find the sweet point between having the sky as dark as possible but having Venus high enough that you can see it. Uh, and as always with these things, it depends on your your southeast southeastern horizon and, and um, trying to find one that's not got lots of obstructions, trees, buildings and so on so that you can observe it as early as possible. If we go to the morning of the 7th, you can see already that as we go through the first week of February, Venus is getting lower and harder to spot. Then um, we have Venus and a very thin crescent moon. This crescent moon will be very difficult to spot, so a bit of a challenge for you um, is to see if you can spot these two on the morning of the 7th. Venus will be much easier to spot than the moon. And as always, when you're trying to observe these early morning objects, make sure that you observe before the sun is up and that you stop when the sun has risen so that you're not going to accidentally look at the sun and damage your eyesight. Let's move on to take a look at the moon now. The full moon in February occurs on the 24th. And our moon watch target for this month is the Mare Imbrium or sea of showers and if i zoom in you can see the full moon um is so we're looking around nine o'clock on the 24th the full moon is in the southeast just below the constellation of leo the lion and if we zoom in you can see that i am ringing the sea of showers or the mare imbrium with my mouse now it's huge it's a circular sea around 760 miles in diameter and it's thought to be the second youngest lunar basin um, formed around 3.85 billion years ago when a protoplanet collided with the moon and the impact occurred during what's known as the late heavy bombardment which is a period of time in the early solar system that saw the inner planets pelted with impactors and the sea of showers um, is really interesting because it provides us with an insight into that period of the moon's evolution. Some of our knowledge about the sea of showers comes from the Apollo 14 mission. Uh, so this month marks its 52nd anniversary and they landed in uh, at Fra Moro, which was originally intended to be the landing site of Apollo 13 before that mission went wrong and they were unable to land on the moon. And its aim was to investigate the geology and impact ejector around the Mare Imbrium. If you want to view the Bay of Rainbows, then it's best to do it with a telescope, um, a reasonably sized one with a, um, an objective lens or a front aperture of um, 100 millimetres or larger or four inches or larger will give you the best view of the, the Bay of Rainbows. The Sea of Showers itself, you, you'll be able to see it with the naked eye. And if you get in there with a telescope, then you'll start to see some more of the structure. You'll see some craters and so on. Um, and as always, um, when observing lunar features, most of the lunar features anyway, the best time to observe them isn't when the moon is full. Um, explore the area that you're looking at, your area of interest, when the Terminator is crossing it, because then you'll get lots of interesting interplay between light and shadow, um, and some of the features will show up much more prominently than they do when the whole face of the moon is illuminated. So experiment with observing the sea of showers on different days, and you can, if you do it on multiple days over the month, you can have a look at how things appear to change as well. Another feature that you don't want to miss when you're looking at this area of the moon is this crater, the dark crater Plato. And it's a very distinctive feature that you should be able to pick up with a pair of binoculars and certainly with a small telescope. So I encourage you to see if you can spot Plato as well. Let's take a look at our solar system target for February now, which is the comet Kushida. And this represents a really good opportunity to see a faint comet, especially if you haven't managed to do so before because it passes right through the head of Taurus. So the head of the ball, the, the, the comet Kushida passes straight through it between the 5th and the 10th of February. And Taurus is a wonderful target anyway. So you can see here we're um, looking towards the um, southwest at around 9 o'clock. I'm going to take us to the 5th of February though. Um, so 
we are in the right part of the month. And the best time to do this is when the sky is as dark as possible because the comet is really faint. Um, you can take in the sights of Taurus. So you've got Aldebaran, the angry eye of the bull, this brilliant bright red star. You've got the Pleiades uh, star cluster, also known as the Seven Sisters. So have a go at looking for all of these things. And then um, see if you have a small telescope, see if you can spot the comet Kushida. And it will be shining at around ninth magnitude, which is much too faint to see with the naked eye. So don't try and find it with your naked eye. Sweep around with your small telescope and see if you can spot it. And if we look at its movements from the 5th, the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th and 10th of February. So a really good time to look for it if the sky is clear is to have a go on the 10th when it's really close to this bright star. And you might be able to spot that the comet has a greenish colour about it, which will be a really nice contrast to the reddy colour of Aldebaran. Um, so hopefully clear skies between the 5th and the 10th of February for a really good opportunity to spot a faint comet travelling through one of the brightest constellations in the night sky. Let's go to our constellation of the month now, which is Canis Major. So you can see it here just above the southern horizon. It appears low in the winter and the spring sky and is depicted as a dog, one of Orion's two hunting dogs along with Canis Minor. And you can see it here chasing Lepus the hare. The uh, Sirius, sometimes known as the dog star, is um, a really, really bright star. It's the brightest star in the night sky and it represents the dog's nose or is sometimes depicted being held in the dog's jaws. Um, Canis Major is sometimes referred to as the dog with the blazing face because of the, the bright star Sirius that is the, the most prominent thing in the constellation. If you are struggling to find it, you can find Sirius using Orion's belt as a pointer. So find Orion's belt and then use it as a pointer to point downwards to Sirius. Um, if you've been observing Taurus and the comet Kushida, then you can um, also use Orion's belt to point upwards to Taurus as well. Sirius is a binary star. Um, it's only 8.6 light years away from us, so it's quite close to us. Um, of the two stars that make up the binary, Sirius A is a white main sequence star and Sirius B is a white dwarf that orbits every 50 years. Um, Sirius B is often called the pup and it's not visible to the naked eye. Uh, in fact, even if you have a large telescope and lots of experience, it's quite a difficult observation to make because of the huge brightness difference between the two. Our sun is fated to become a white dwarf star like Sirius B um, in about 5 billion years time when it exhausts all of its nuclear fuel and it will expel its outer layers um, into space and leave behind this glowing ember which is what's known as a white dwarf star. Sirius comes from the Greek word meaning scorching or searing. In ancient times, the star rose just before the sun in the summer, and the ancient Greeks and Romans thought it was responsible for the summer heat, which is where the phrase the dog days of summer comes from. The Egyptians called Sirius the Nile star because it always returned just before the river rose and so announced the coming of the floodwaters that would nourish their lands. If you would like to have a go at a deep sky object in uh, Canis Major, then you can try and find the open cluster M41. Um, if you have a pair of really wide uh, field binoculars, you might even get it in the same binocular view as Sirius. Um, you can see it down here as a fuzzy patch. It is potentially possible to view it with the naked eye if you have a nice dark sight and very good vision and a clear sky you might find it with the naked eye it's easier to find with a pair of binoculars where it will look like a fuzzy patch if you have a small telescope at low magnification you'll uh, be able to spot around 50 stars hopefully if you have a larger telescope you'll be able to see more um, and now is the best time of the year to observe M41. So if you haven't had a, an opportunity to view an open cluster like this before, then M41 is a good one to start with. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for February 2024. And I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.